All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Maggie Steinhauer. Um, I am a part of the research team here at the Urban Ecology Center, as well as a member of the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society, which is a nonprofit in Wisconsin dedicated to um, encouraging the enjoyment and conservation of dragonflies and damselflies. Um, today's talk will be um, about the family Odonata, uh, which is comprised of the dragonflies and damselflies. There we go. Um, we'll talk in general about the family uh, as well as um, how you may encounter them in Wisconsin. Um, so we'll talk through their life cycle, um, morphology, reproduction, behavior, and importance. So what is an odonate? Odonates are animals. Um, they are uh, arthropods, meaning they have an exoskeleton. They're in uh, class insecta, so they do have a head, thorax, and abdomen, as well as six legs. And they are in the order odonata, which means toothed ones. You can see on the picture here, um, they have a very strong jaw, very strong mandible that sometimes even appears to have these jagged teeth to them. Within the, the order Odonata, um, we have uh, Anisoptera and Zygoptera, which make up the dragonflies and damselflies. So Anisoptera is our dragonflies, and that means uneven wings. Um, and Zygoptera means equal wings. So damselflies, typically, they're, they're four wings. They each have two sets of wings. Um, and all wings are about the same size and shape. And the dragonflies and Anisoptera, they, their hind wings are slightly uh, larger and wider than their four wings. There is a third suborder called Anisozygoptera, but for our purposes, um, we don't really work with that suborder very often. I believe there's only one species in that suborder, and it's not in North America. Um, so the difference between dragonflies versus damselflies, um, there are a few different ways to tell them apart. Uh, some of the ways that we can do this are by their flight and how they fly, um, their abdomen shape and size, where their eyes are placed on their head, and how they hold their wings while they're perched. So on the left here, we have a dragonfly, and on the right, we have a damselfly. Dragonflies typically are more robust. They have kind of a larger, chunkier abdomen. Um, and typically they're larger than damselflies, although this is not always the case. Um, damselflies are generally smaller and more slender, um, and they, they, you'll find them kind of lower down towards vegetation. Um, when it comes to their eyes, uh, dragonflies on the left, their eyes most of the time touch at some point in the center of their head um, and it kind of their, their eyes kind of cover their entire head almost like a helmet. Damselflies on the other hand um, are widely separated um, kind of like a dumbbell or I like to think of it as a, like a hammerhead shark. Um, and there is an exception uh, club tail dragonflies which is a family within the order um, the, their eyes are separate. So there's always an exception to the rule, but typically speaking, most of the, the dragonfly's head will be taken up by eyes, whereas the damselfly will be widely separated. Um, how they hold their wings while they are perched on vegetation. Um, damsel, damselflies on the right um, will hold their wings folded up over their abdomen, and then dragonflies on the left will hold their wings out outspread while they're perched. Um, going into the history of dragonflies. So um, back just before the, just before the dragonflies, just before the dinosaurs, 
um, there was a giant uh, uh, organism that was very similar to a dragonfly called Meganeura. Um, and this, this um, creature had a wingspan of about two feet, so it was massive. Um, and it is thought now that dragonflies are related to this, um, this species. There also is a lot of uh, history and folklore um, when it comes to dragonflies. So historically, different cultures have viewed them differently. Um, some cultures view them as evil uh, or, or dangerous, and some view them as, as a sign of good luck or very spiritual creature. Typically, um, uh, regions in uh, Europe fall more on the on the former side. They they have more history and and legend um, about them being kind of dangerous. And then more of the Asian um, culture is is more. Uh, supporting the signs of good luck and things. Um, so there are actually some stories about uh, former emperors of Japan, either naming the, the island, island of the dragonfly or dragonfly island, or um, there was a, a divine emperor once that had, um, he, he went up to the top of the mountain and he was sitting on the mountain and a horsefly kept bothering him. Um, and then a dragonfly out of nowhere and ate, ate the horsefly. So uh, dragonflies were very important after that. Um, you can find dragonfly art even in um, samurai armor, in helmets, as well as in different poetry and different artwork um, from all over the world and different cultures. Um, there was a, an old tale about um, the Darner name, which is a family of dragonflies, um, and that adults would tell kind of naughty kids that um, if they weren't quiet or if they didn't tell the truth that a Darner dragonfly would come by in the night and sew their mouth and ears and eyes shut. Um, so there are a lot of, a lot of different um, stories when it comes to dragonflies. Um, they are present almost worldwide, except for Antarctica, um, and they need fresh water to survive. So typically we'll see dragonflies and dragonflies um, at or near a source of fresh water, whether that's a lake, a river, a pond, um, different wetlands. All different species have their own habitat requirements. Um, and worldwide, we have over 6,000 species. In North America, we have um, close to 500. And in Wisconsin, we have, I think at this point now, it's about 166 um, species. It's a relatively new field of study. So we're constantly learning more about different species that are um, either they've already been in Wisconsin um, and we just haven't found them yet, or whether they're expanding their ranges um, due to climate change or other factors. Um, some dragonfly species are migratory and some are not. Um, I think there are about 16 to 18 species in North America that are migratory. Um, and five of those are regular Wisconsin species that we can see here. Um, we have the common green darner, spot-winged glider, wandering glider, black saddlebags, and the variegated meadowhawk. Um, and on the left side is our common green darner, which I'll get into here. But that is one of the large, most largely studied um, dragonfly migrations here. So if this scene looks kind of familiar to you, usually around September, late summer, early fall, um, this is actually a sign of um, kind of the, the movement of common green darner um, populations as they move south for the winter. Um, so when they're in these huge masses, they are uh, practicing feeding behavior. Um, you'll typically see this closer to the lakefront 
Um, and, and sometimes there will be like a large emergence event um, where they will all emerge um, from underwater, which we'll get into later, but they emerge and they're feeding um, before they move down in a group. Um, and actually it is known that some species of birds will actually time their migration with the dragonfly migration because it's a food source on their way. Um, and this is a close-up picture of a common green darner. They're large dragonflies. Um, and uh, we're actually just starting to see them come in for the spring now. Um, so the migratory population, um, they, they can come as early as March. Um, I've typically seen them in April. I think it was April 5th this year um, that it seemed like a lot of people were seeing their first common green darners. Um, and then in early fall, they begin moving southward. Um, it's, it's known that they, they move around the Gulf of Mexico, um, but uh, they may be going farther than that as well. Um, so those adults will, will lay eggs um, down south and then those young will become adults and fly back up north in the spring. Um, Tim mentioned a MODIS lecture that we have with our Brew City Birding Festival coming up. Um, and it's widely known that MODIS is used for birds, but it can also be used on common green darners because of their size. Um, so we can actually track their migration with these towers and those radio transmitters um, by applying one directly onto the dragonfly, like you can see in the picture. Um, another common species that is um, considered the most widely distributed dragonfly species is called the wandering glider. And it has the longest cumul cumulative migration of any insect. It's also known as the globe skimmer. And it was actually found to um, have a, a regular migration from um, India to Southeast Africa. Um, and this is with about three generations. Um, so each generation travels about um, 3000 miles. There's a really interesting TED talk on this, Charles Anderson, if anyone is interested in listening to that. Um, so now I'll talk a bit about their life cycle. Um, so dragonflies and damselflies uh, practice incomplete metamorphosis. So when we think of metamorphosis, um, a good example is uh, butterfly metamorphosis, and that is um, complete metamorphosis. So that is the egg to the larva, to the, the pupa, and then the adult stage. And in incomplete metamorphosis, we don't have that chrysalis stage. Um, so we go from egg to larva, and the larva um, gets larger and larger, and then they become the adult. Um, so eggs are laid in the water, they spend time underwater, and then they crawl out and become an adult. In the larval stage, it's called the naiad stage or the nymph stage. Um, uh, dragonflies and damselflies will spend anywhere from um, a couple months to some species a couple years underwater. Um, and in this time, they, they breathe through um, kind of these gills. Damselflies on the left here, they have gills sticking off of the end of their abdomen um, and dragonflies have gills inside of their rectum. Um, and that is how they breathe the dissolved oxygen um, and how they, uh, how they travel. So dragonfly nymphs are pretty cool actually because they, they can rapidly um, intake and expel water and that gives them jet propulsion um, and that helps them in hunting. Um, and in this stage, they'll go from anywhere to from like 12 to up to 12 to 16 different stages. So they're con constantly getting larger and larger and shedding that husk um, as they grow. 
In this stage, this is a video that is not working, unfortunately, but um, they have a kind of a modified jaw um, under their chin here that can pop out really fast and help them hunt. And that can pop out to about a third of their body length. Um, so they're voracious predators. They eat all sorts of um, aquatic insects, sometimes even small fish, depending on the species, um, and other dragonfly larvae, as well as a lot and a lot, a lot of mosquito larvae. So this is a really great time to um, have, a, have a good control on the mosquito population because they can eat so much of it. Um, as they get closer to becoming an adult or ready to start the process to become an adult, um, they'll rise towards the surface of the water for their last few days. Um, that jaw will retract and then they'll start um, breathing more oxygen at the time. Once water temperatures are ripe, um, they will uh, crawl out of the water. Um, and different species kind of prefer different areas. So you might see them on a log, a tree, different vegetation um, or rocks even, whether it's kind of just peeking out of the water um, or a few feet offshore. And they crawl up onto this, this substrate and over the course of a few hours, they, they peel themselves out of this husk or what we call the exuvia. Um, and the adult will just kind of sit there for a few hours and start to dry and their body will start to harden um, as the hemolymph. So the, the green bug blood kind of uh, flows through their body, through their wings, um, their wings unfold. It's a very precarious time for them. They're very susceptible to predation as well as adverse weather events. Um, even so much as like a strong wind or if a, if a wave comes up and brushes them off, like they can be easily washed off at this point. Um, once they successfully kind of harden over that time period, um, they start to mature. So it takes a, a couple weeks for dragonflies to reach sexual maturity. Um, and in this time, they are kind of gaining color. Um, they're flying, typically they can fly away from um, their, their usual breeding grounds. So they don't necessarily stick around water at this point. Um, they're foraging, they're gaining strength. Um, and as you can see on the left, the female kind of has her color and you can see those jewel tones in the wings. Um, that's kind of indicative that she's a, a fresher dragonfly. Um, immature male, he has those white bands on his wings and then the mature male and other mature dragonflies sometimes exhibit what's called prunescence or prunosity, um, which is kind of this like chalky white substance. Um, and so you can oftentimes tell the general age of a dragonfly um, based on that, um, that, that chalky substance in certain species. Um, similar to some other species, dragonflies and damselflies are sexually dimorphic, meaning that the males and females appear different in some way. Um, the way that they typically are dimorphic is in their coloration. Um, so with the Eastern Pond Hawk here, uh, the female has this green and brown look to her. And typically um, there are some species where the immature male looks very similar to an adult female. Um, so uh, yeah, female and immature male can look similar. And then as the male matures, he's gaining different colors. Um, and then as he gets older, he's gonna get more of that chalky coloration in the species. So sometimes it's easy to tell them apart, like in the, in the pond hawk, um, but some species can be more difficult to tell apart. 
like the black saddlebags or the Halloween pennant. Um, the females and males are, are pretty similar in, in most of their coloration and size. And um, this is when uh, being able to look at their anatomy can really help us decipher whether it's a, a male or female dragonfly. Um, so we will get into the morphology. So um, general or odonate anatomy morphology, they, they have their, their head, where's my mouse? My, their head, their, their thorax, and their abdomen. And all odonates have 10 abdominal segments. Um, they have six legs and two sets of wings. Um, when it comes to reproductive organs, um, they have uh, kind of differing sets. So females will have their reproductive organs around um, between segments like eight and 10. Um, and males is where it gets to be very helpful in determining different species um, based on what kind of uh, appendages they have. So males carry their um, primary genitalia at the tip of their abdomen down here. Um, and then they carry their secondary genitalia up between segments two and three. Um, and both of those are used in the copulation process. Um, and dragonflies and damselflies have slightly different um, kind of sets of appendages at the end of their abdomen. And depending on the species, um, everything looks a little bit different. Um, so what makes them so special? Uh, they have some really cool adaptations um, to make them incredible flyers and predators. Um, they have the stigma, which are these little rectangular filled in sections in their wings. Um, it's thought that they may pr help provide um, stability in flight and kind of dampen vibrations in the wings. Um, they also have the nodules here in the center of the wings, which is kind of like a bracing point. Um, when, they, when they put their wings down in flight to kind of push them, propel them forward, that braces against the wind. Um, so it, it really helps them go faster because it's a stronger brace. Um, their wings are also attached directly to the muscles beneath the exoskeleton rather than just to the exoskeleton itself. And they are all able to operate independently from one another, which allows them to, to fly very um, agilely, agilely is that right? <laughs> with, with a much agility. Um, and quick, sharp maneuvering. Um, they also have uh, setae, which are these small hair-like structures on their legs. Um, and they don't really use their legs for walking, but they do um, use them kind of as a basket to catch prey. And those hairs are really sticky and they really secure the prey that, that they catch in midair um, so that it doesn't escape. They also have, um, Aside from bees, the best, uh, the best vision of insects, um, they have compound eyes. And within um, their eyes, they have up to 30,000 different facets, um, which allow them to see an incredible um, kind of detailed and full picture of what's going on. They have almost 360 degree vision. Um, they just have one blind spot and it's just directly behind their head. So all of these things really help them become these strong predators. Um, and when we go back to kind of telling the difference between males and females um, in the field, if, if they look very similar to one another in color and you're questioning, questioning what the sex is, um, by examining that secondary genitalia on the males, um, you'll see this little bump here um, versus on the female, it's usually a flat surface. Getting into reproduction, 
Um, if you've ever seen dragonflies flying around in this weird attached uh, formation, they are currently mating. Um, so this is called that uh, they're in wheel or in tandem. Um, and uh, this can last anywhere from a few minutes to a few hours, depending on the species. Um, and the way it works is the male, which is this darker blue damselfly here on top, he will take his uh, primary, his, his terminal appendages, so they're called claspers. I like to think of it as kind of the, the claw game at the arcade to go grab a, a duck or a stuffed animal or something. Um, and he has those claspers and he grabs the female behind her head. Um, and then she, oh wait, rewind, sorry. First, so he stores his sperm in his primary genitalia at the tip of his abdomen. He first transfers that up to his secondary genitalia here so that it's ready for when he connects to the female, he grabs her behind the, the head and she swings her um, abdomen up to meet that area. Um, and they, the, some male dragonflies actually have the ability to um, remove a previous male's sperm from a female. Um, so this becomes a very important um, reason for why some dragonflies like to practice guarding um, one another so that the, um, so that other males cannot move in and um, take the female from him. Sometimes uh, you'll actually see a female flying around with a male's abdomen attached to her neck, but not his thorax or his head because he had been picked off by a predator in midair, but that the, those claspers are so tight that they, they stay stuck <laughs> to her for um, possibly ever. Um, so yeah, on the left we have dragonflies and on the right we have a set of damselflies. Um, when we get into egg laying, uh, different species will lay eggs in different ways. So um, some practice exophytic uh, egg laying, so that is um, not into plant material. So they'll kind of dip their abdomen onto a surface or onto the water. Um, endophytic, some species have uh, an ovipositor, so where they lay their eggs out of on their abdomen, um, and they have this little hook uh, structure on it that kind of acts as a seam ripper, and they're able to kind of inject their eggs into, um, into a plant. Um, like I mentioned, some species will practice guarding as the female lays her eggs. Um, some species, the male leaves, which is an unguarded ovipositing situation, um, but some species practice different methods of guarding. So there's contact guarding where they stay connected, but they're just kind of in a line like this. Um, and you'll see the female kind of dipping her abdomen down onto the water. Um, and then there's also non-contact or hovering guarding. So the male will stay kind of close to the female, but unattached. And then there is perched guarding where um, a male will, will stay within the territory and keep an eye out for any other males that may come by as the female is overpositing. Getting into behavior. Um, so some dragonflies practice their Ooh, I'm sorry. Thermal regulation um, and obelisking is a term that is used. Um, so they are able to orient their abdomen toward or away from the sun, whether they are too hot or too cold. Um, and some will actually pull their wings forward to shade their thorax. Um, the blue dasher is a really good example of the species. Um, and it, you can see it doing this quite often. Um, patrolling is another behavior that we see uh, oftentimes near ponds. If you, you observe for a while, you'll see dragonflies kind of staking out their territories. Um, these are oftentimes the males 
as females choose males based on prime real estate. So they want the best habitat for their eggs to be laid. So males will uh, choose territories and fight over their territories um, based on uh, the habitat quality. So you'll see dragonflies kind of zooming back and forth around one area. Um, it may kind of look like feeding and they may, they may pick insects up out of the, the sky as they're doing this, but um, they are also kind of watching the territory to make sure no other males try to invade. Um, they eat all sorts of insects, primarily small flying insects, um, bees, midges, gnats, mosquitoes, some small butterflies. Um, they can eat upwards of 100 mosquitoes per day. Um, and they are, uh, um, very accurate in their, in their, um, predation, which I will get to as well. They also will eat each other. Um, so you won't usually see dragonflies feasting on other dragonflies, but it does happen. Um, typically the larger species, for instance, the dragon hunter, um, which is not pictured here, this is a pond hawk, <clears throat> a pond hawk eating a a, an amber wing, a small, small dragonfly. Um, but the, dra the dragon hunter is a very large species and it's, it has been known to eat other dragonflies. Um, it's a really impressive one. So they have a, a wide uh, variety of, of prey that they, they eat. Um, like birds, they feed in different ways. Um, so hawking, so they'll catch prey while flying. Um, sallying, so they, they perch on vegetation and then they will um, fly out, grab prey, and then fly back to their perch. Or gleaning, which is typically seen by some of the, the pond damselflies. Um, they'll just kind of hover above vegetation um, and grab them as they go. Dragonflies have uh, about a 95 and up percent um, success rate when it comes to um, catching their prey. And there, there have been studies actually to figure out how this works. Um, and they are actually able to uh, determine where their prey will, will be. It's, it's kind of path of movement and how to intercept it at the right time, which is just really fascinating. Um, birds, frogs, fish, spiders, um, all sorts of things will also eat dragonflies. Um, so they are a valuable part of the food chain. Typically it's the more agile flying birds um, like swallows, um, some kingfishers and um, gnat catchers, birds like that. Um, sometimes you'll see a, a bird kind of with a dragonfly in its mouth and it'll be smacking it against something to try to, to, try to kill it so it can eat it. Um, I've actually also seen a wasp eating a dragonfly. So they are valuable parts of the food chain um, and they eat a lot and they are eaten by a lot as well. Um, they are very important creatures in many ways. Um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is their use in biomimicry. Um, so certain helicopters, drones, wind turbines, things are used. Um, some of those designs are inspired by or incorporate some um, idea of dragonfly morphology and how they move. Um, wind turbines, the blades are made kind of more um, flexible but durable and streamlined by the, um, inspired by kind of the, the wings of the dragonfly. Um, I was reading a study on missile defense and how they can intercept prey and how their head and vision works in order to do that and how that can be used um, in, in the military as well in machine learning. Um, bionic eyes and driverless cars as well because of their incredible vision 
and their visual processes and how those work. Um, so it's a very interesting topic. Um, and it's so cool to see things based off of nature and incorporating ideas from nature. Um, they also, like I've mentioned, are incredible mosquito control, most effective in their larval stage. So underwater eating mosquito larva, incredibly effective. Um, but as adults, they will also eat upwards of 100 mosquitoes per day, which is about 10 to 15% of their body weight. Um, and they also eat many other annoying insects. Um, they're valuable parts of the food chain. So they are eaten by a lot of critters who are then eaten by other critters. Um, they're important bioindicators, so they can tell us about the health of a habitat we're interested in um, because certain species require different um, uh, kind of parts of a habitat, different water quality measurements. Um, so if we want to look at um, how, how a certain habitat is doing, would we expect to see that dragonfly there? And if we do see that it's breeding there, then that's a good sign. Um, and as well as, um, is there prey source there? Are, there? are there smaller insects there for them to eat? Best of all, they're not harmful to us at all. Um, they don't bite us. They cannot sting us. It is a misconception that they can sting. They cannot. Um, and they don't carry disease and they're just beautiful to watch. And they're so cool how just amazing they are at catching things and just existing and in all their beautiful colors. So it's just a wonderful insect to have. Um, if you are interested in getting involved in learning more about odonates, um, with the Urban Ecology Center, we have Odonate surveys June through September at all three branches. Um, we go out in the field with nets and we catch species. We also observe them from afar and we document um, what they are and then we record them uh, and submit the data both to, to our um, database as well as to the Wisconsin Odonata survey. Um, those surveys typically run Tuesday through Thursday, and you can look on our website calendar for more information. Um, also, the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society website and Facebook page are really, really great resources to learn more. Um, the Facebook page is super active, especially in the summertime with ID help and um, different sightings, different places to check out um, to go survey. Um, and then uh, if you're interested in field guides, um, there are some great examples on the Dragonfly Society website. Lastly, not to conflict too much with tomorrow's subscriber walk, um, but if you are feeling excited about dragonflies, um, there is an identification workshop at the Mequon Nature Preserve um, hosted by the, the Wisconsin Dragonfly Society. Um, it's free, um, and it would be great to see anyone there who would like to go. So I think that is all I have today, um, and I can take any questions. <laughs>